warm welcome to this exciting event, Creating Better Lives. My name is Kain De Manji and I work for Age Scotland as the project manager for About Dementia. We are a national policy and practice forum that puts the rights and voices of people with dementia and unpaid carers at the very heart of our work. We're also hugely honoured to be one of the Life Changes Trust legacy partners for the Dementia Programme and have been working closely with them for a number of years. I hope you're all doing well today. It is a beautiful, crisp and sunny December morning here in Stirling and I can see from the chat already that people are joining us from the length and breadth of Scotland as far away as Ben Becula, uh, Kirimuir, Aberdeenshire, others in the rural Stirlingshire, both of the Lothians and many, many more and it's wonderful to have you all here today. Before we start, I just want to say that today is actually a bit of a celebration, so champagne corks at the ready. This event is the culmination of three years of work towards the Community and Dementia Creating Better Lives series of regional events that's been running since 2018. In November of that year, the Trust began a countrywide tour engaging with all 14 local health boards across Scotland. The Trust really wanted to bring communities together to find out how they could support those communities to create better lives for individuals and families living with dementia. Some of these events took place face to face in the days when that was possible, and obviously some had to be moved online. But either way, along the way, they've gathered a huge body of evidence about the importance of local support and locally generated dementia strategies based on what people living with dementia and unpaid carers themselves have said. For all of the regional events, the Life Changes Trust worked in partnership with numerous local stakeholders, people living with dementia and unpaid carers, as well as others in the community who support individuals, families or projects. These partnerships helped the planning and development of each event so that they were meaningful to local communities led by those communities themselves and focused on upholding the human rights of people with dementia and unpaid carers. And I know that many of you were there and will remember what wonderful, rich, exciting and very, very unique events those all were. So today really is a celebration of and a reflection on this three year journey. And today we'll be sharing some of the learning and evidence that's been gathered as we go through the morning. Before we start in earnest, I do have a few housekeeping points. So this is where I do my air hostess bit. There's no break scheduled in today's programme, but if you do need some time away from your screens, as we all do from time to time, then that's absolutely fine. The event is being recorded and it will be on the Life Changes Trust website soon, so you can catch up with anything that you've missed. We will be emailing everybody when this information is available. Please feel free also, as many of you already have, to pop your comments in the chat section. You'll see that there's a drop down option in the menu, which gives you the chance to share your comments with everybody. It is always nice to share, so please remember to select the with everyone option. As the old BT advert used to say, it is good to talk. So now on to today's event. I've spoken already a little bit about how the Trust developed their regional events in collaboration with communities themselves. Linked to these events, the Trust also launched a small grants programme in each area to enable the communities to develop their own opportunities to support people with dementia and unpaid carers. We'll be hearing a little bit more about this later. In most areas they visited, the Trust also commissioned the Village Storytelling Centre to run storytelling sessions. These sessions use creative methods to support people to tell their story in a gentle, practical and inclusive way. They provide a space where people can talk directly about what is important to them and how they would like their support to be delivered. People living with dementia, unpaid carers and those who work with and support them were invited to take part. These sessions ran in most areas but understandably, in these challenging times, one or two felt that it was not quite the right moment for them to participate. Similarly, delivering a full online conference was not always suitable for communities, including Shetland, at this time. However, 
wherever these have taken place, there has still been meaningful learning and activity for local partners to build on whenever that time is right. After the storytelling sessions, all of the conversations and stories help to form a set of local priorities for each of those areas participating based on what people were saying. Let's take a moment now to hear a bit more about the journey of the Life Changes Trust across Scotland and what people were saying was most important to them. In November 2018, the Life Changes Trust began a countrywide tour engaging with all 14 local health board areas across Scotland. The Trust wanted to bring local communities together to find out how they could support those communities to create better lives for families affected by dementia. With each area they visited, the Life Changes Trust held storytelling sessions to find out directly from people with dementia and unpaid carers what was important to them and what would make the most difference to their lives in their own communities. These conversations helped shape a set of local priorities for each area, which reflected what people with dementia and unpaid carers had said. So, back in November 2018, the Life Changes Trust hit the road and headed north to Inverness. Their travels took them to Highland, Grampian and then to the archipelago of Orkney. The journey continued from the Western Isles to Ayrshire and Arran and then to Edinburgh and the Lothians. By now there were some common themes emerging, for example, the importance of peer support for people with dementia and unpaid carers and the crucial role that communities themselves play in delivering services and support. Each time the Trust visited somewhere new, it became clear that what people with dementia and unpaid carers wanted most was respect, support that was individual to them, and to have their human rights upheld. And so the journey continued from the Kingdom of Fife to Tayside. It quickly became apparent that people living with dementia were concerned about how they're treated and how they're often left out of discussions and decisions that involve their care and their lives. With so much valuable information already collected, the Trust headed onwards to Forth Valley, Lanarkshire and the Borders. Throughout their journey, the Trust also heard from carers about their own experiences. Many expressed feelings of isolation, particularly during the pandemic, and felt they were offered very little help and often only when they'd reached crisis point. And so, on the last leg of the journey, the Life Changes Trust headed to Dumfries and Galloway, Shetland and finally to Greater Glasgow and Clyde. There were more common themes, particularly around support, how difficult it could be to access and how services needed to be more joined up so that people didn't have to keep telling their stories again and again. it was clear that what people really wanted was respect, empowerment, and to be listened to and valued. With the help of so many people with dementia, unpaid carers, professionals, and volunteers, the Life Changes Trust has developed a strong body of evidence that highlights the importance of community-led support and locally developed strategies. The Trust has already been using this evidence to help change local and national perspectives on dementia. Now and going forward, the work of creating better lives for people with dementia and unpaid carers will be continued by Life Changes Trust Legacy Partners. A new journey begins.
That was a wonderful animation. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everybody who took part in all of the storytelling sessions and regional events. They really did give such a level of insight that the trust genuinely otherwise would not have been able to gain. So thank you again for, for sharing so honestly with us. So that's a little bit about the local priorities across the country. As you saw in the animation, very quickly it became clear that while demography and geography meant that priorities were specific to particular areas, there were also common themes emerging from the importance of peer support to the role local communities play in providing services, something we saw particularly keenly during the, the pandemic, activities, social connections, and that all of these in themselves form such an important and vital part of post-diagnostic support. The local priorities are already being used across many communities to influence dementia policy and practice and we expect that this will continue so that people living with dementia and unpaid carers really do have a meaningful say in their day-to-day -day lives. Based on those emerging themes, the Trust has also collated a set of national priorities which they and the team and I at About Dementia are going to be taking forward to influence national decision-making and strategies. I'm going to hand over now to Shona Cowie from the Village Storytelling Centre, whose sessions helped identify the local priorities, to talk about how these have translated into a set of national priorities. Shona, it's lovely to see you and over to you. Thank you very much, Kaindi. It's so wonderful to be here. And I had, hadn't seen that an animation, it was incredible, it's so special to see the culmination of all the work and see it shared so beautifully in that story. Um, I'm a bit emotional. So yes, I'm the storyteller that led the second part of this project when we moved online. Um, myself, along with my colleagues at the Village Storytelling Centre, we didn't initially believe that it would be possible to translate what is a very live and in-person art form um, online. We say in the storytelling scene, we work eye to eye and heart to heart. Um, we believe it's face to face, this art form. And I think we probably share a lot of similarities with caring in that sense. So yeah, two years ago, I didn't think it would be possible to move online, but it was. And in fact, although of course we lost some aspects of, of physical connection, we did gain some others that were unexpected. We were able to broaden out our reach and talk to even more people. And we also removed some of the barriers. It's always my aim as a storyteller to help to make a conversation feel like it's happening around a kitchen table, sometimes, or in a pub, and to have that atmosphere of uh, friendship and warmth and fluidity of connection. And suddenly we actually were in people's homes, around kitchen tables, sitting on sofas, Sometimes we had conversations with people already tucked up in bed. And this intimacy and this connection led to some really profound discussions and probably we were able to get deeper than we might have done otherwise. But what is storytelling? It's a very hard thing to describe. It's kind of like a pomegranate. You know what it tastes like if you've tasted it, but it's very hard to articulate that to someone who's never tasted it. So I thought, I would take the opportunity to share with you a short story. And this is the story that I used the most in the last year. And it's quite appropriate for today, this crisp, cold day. So I hope you're all sitting comfortably and maybe have something warm to drink. And we'll begin. This is a story about a man who lives in isolation from other human beings. He lives alone in a forest in Argyll. <clears throat> That's where I am right now. He lives in a little hut. It's a very simple life. He has a small fire in the corner. He has some baskets for his things. During the spring and the summer and the autumn, the forest can give him everything he needs. He can gather berries and have honey. He can catch wild salmon and garlic, wild garlic and pine nuts. He can make a delicious salmon pesto meal. He can get fruits and he can catch animals. Not all the time though. But in the winter, when the ground is hard, like today, life is much harder for him. He can't grow things and he can't collect things. And so this man, he needs to make a little bit of money. He gathers firewood and he takes it to a nearby village to sell. 
he gets a little bit of money from that and he can buy supplies. But these exchanges are never happy because the villagers are very quick to point out, he's not like us. He doesn't live in a house like us. He lives, do you know he lives in a hut in a forest? And he probably smells as well because he's a forest dweller. And do you know what? He's ugly. Have you seen the size of his nose? Have you seen the huge hunch he has on his back? And the man did have a hunch on his back, but he never realized until it was pointed out to him so cruelly. They were whispering, but of course he could hear them. But he could never say anything back because he didn't have the power of his voice. He was what they called a mute. And the little children, they were the worst. They played this game where they threw little stones and they'd get 10 points if they could hit it off his head. And they'd get 100 points if they could get it off his hunchback. And so the man would leave the village, yes, with supplies, but not feeling great at all. I said this man lives alone, isolated from humans, but he wasn't alone entirely. He had around him a community of animals. They were his friends. And when he left the village back into the forest, his best friend, the ferret, would run up to him, wrap himself around his neck and whisper in his ear, you're beautiful, you are beautiful, don't listen to them. And his friend, the crow, would squawk on his shoulder, nah, they're all wee creeps anyway, they're creeps. And the robin would flutter about his head talking about equality and diversity and, and sharing equally our supplies. And he, he was a bit of a Marxist. And the, the squirrels would be doing backflips in the trees, making him laugh. And soon he would feel better. And they'd share the supplies and they'd play together and they'd chat. They buoyed him, his friends. And every evening, this man, he would go to the loch side and he'd stand there and he waited because it was there that every night he saw the love of his life. He was in love with a swan. And as the sun set, he saw her coming into land elegantly, beautifully, soft on the surface of the cold water. And he'd yearned to call out to her, but remember, he doesn't have his voice. He yearned for her and he wished that one day she would swim over to him and they could maybe be together. But she never did. She just turned her beautiful head and swam away. She was not interested in any men. She knew what those men were like. She saw them in the village. They tried to chase her. They threw stones at her. And so she never went to him. But sometimes she did go to the place he'd been standing when he'd left and pick up a little present he'd brought for her. And so life was like for this man. He led a brilliant life in the spring, in the summer, in the autumn. He had everything he needed. He had his animal friends, food to eat, warmth. And in the winter, life was harder. He'd wait every day for the love of his life who gave him no interest and he'd be with his animal friends. And time passed and the seasons passed. And soon life got even harder for the man because the little boys that threw the little stones, they became big boys that threw the bigger. And so he'd leave the village not only feeling dejected, but limping and in pain and injured until one day he didn't appear at the village to sell his sticks. And it was the coldest day of the year. And the villagers, they said, not only is he not like us, not only does he have a hunchback and he lives in the forest, he's also lazy and he's not getting any more of my money. And they didn't even ask, where is he? What's wrong? Of course the animals did, they went straight to his hut. They went inside and they saw him lying out on his simple mat. He was very weak. And they knew immediately that he was dying of a broken heart. And so only the thing that he loves can fix it. And so they rushed to the loch side just as the sun was setting on this cold winter's day. And they saw coming into land the love of his life, the swan. And they waved to her. The ferret was jumping his little paws in the air. The crow squawking, come here, get over here. And the squirrels jumping and the, the birds fluttering, the robin calling, please, we need your assistance, please. And so the swan comes into land, much less elegantly this time, all her feathers all askew. And she hears them saying, our friend loves you. He's a good man, but he could never tell you because he doesn't have the power of his voice. He's a mute. Please, he's dying and he needs your help. And she thinks about that man that stood there every evening, never tried to chase her often left her tasty treats. And she thought, okay. 
And so they took the swan to the man lying out on his mat. And I don't know if you can imagine what that would feel like after so long, having the person that you love the most in your own home. And they made eye contact. And the swan, she put her head on the man's chest and he stroked her long, elegant neck. And she pulled a feather from her wing and she plunged it into his chest. And the man began to transform. His hunchback started to open out and huge wings emerged. Beautiful, strong swan's wings. They'd always been in there. They'd just been curled up. And so two wee swans left the hut that evening. They waddled down to the side of the loch and they took off together into the sky. And that's the end of that. So that's a Scottish traveller story, which is about Argyle, where I'm from, where I'm living right now. And it's a story I shared a lot during this process. And I think you can see why. It's got um, so many of the themes that are resonant uh, with the, the conversations that we went on to have. A lot was happening when I was telling you that story. First of all, when you share a story, it, um, it gives um, an unconscious signal to other people that this is a space of sharing stories. So one story is shared and then all of the others follow. People want to um, share their empathy, share their experiences, reflect. So stories, sharing a story like that traditional story it opens the space for other conversations to happen. It sets the tone of the conversation. This isn't your normal consultation. This is the space where we can use our imaginations, where we can, anything is possible as well. Um, also, uh, we think about um, how we're feeling before we tell the story. And hopefully in that storytelling session, your adrenaline levels decreased and your serotonin and your dopamine levels increased. So we feel better after we've heard a story. We feel connected to and like we've been cared for in that moment. When you think about it, um, young children, when they um, stumble over to their parent or their caregiver with a, a book, they don't care what the narrative is. They don't even know that there's something called a gruffalo, probably the younger ones, but they already recognize that this, this book symbolizes deep connection with your primary caregiver, a moment of probably of proximity, of closeness, of communication, of being seen and heard, of being loved. So all of that we can tap into with these moments of sharing stories. You probably won't remember any of the details of that story or maybe even what I say next, but you will remember how that made you feel. And I think that's the really important thing about story in, in, in this dementia context. We also work with non-fiction, so anecdotes, autobiography, the day-to-day -day life, particularly in Scotland, and how we communicate. We start with gentle questions, and these seem so insignificant. For example, how do you take your tea? But immediately, people can respond and feel like they've got something to say on this matter. And they see very quickly that everybody has something to say and that everybody's interesting and worthy of being heard. And that's not always the message that the people that we work with and sometimes the people living with dementia um, receive on a day-to-day -day basis. So just knowing that they're interesting and worthy of being heard can open up a lot of confidence and expression. The final technique, so we use non-fiction, autobiography and anecdote. We use fiction, which is the story of the man and the swan that you just heard. Um, but we also use a thing called one step removed. So that's a style of storytelling which feels real. It could be real, it could be any one of us, but it's not. We create characters together. And these characters share similar experiences. So in um, the workshops with people living with dementia, that character would have had a dementia diagnosis recently or unpaid carers, they would be an unpaid carer or a staff or volunteer working with people with dementia. And onto those characters, we can impart our experience and our empathy, but in a safe way. We're not asking people to share the, the most difficult moment of their life. That's not appropriate in that space. It's too um, intense and exposing. But we can say, we've created this character called Kathy. How do we, how is Kathy dealing with her recent dementia diagnosis? Have you got any ideas? Have you got any tips for her? 
And through Kathri, through this vessel that we've created the story, we can express our own experiences in a much safer way. And the people talking can regulate their level of disclosure. So we use story to create a safe space in the group, but also a safe, safe emotional space. Um, so that's a little bit about how we work. And I think storytelling, particularly in dementia contexts, has so many applications. It's a very powerful tool. And I've come to appreciate that more and more as this incredible project has, has carried on, has got underway. And when we think about one of the, one of the issues, one of the big struggles people seem to have with dementia, and particularly, I say this from experience, my grand found this the hardest, that she felt so much pressure to um, recall accurately, to recall fact and to be correct. But immediately with storytelling, that doesn't matter. We're, we're in the world of the invented, of the constructed, of our imaginations, or of the deeply personal. And so it's your opinion. So we take all of that pressure off of, of trying to be correct and giving the right response. And for all of us, the world that we live in is completely narrative. If you think about it, the past, it doesn't exist anymore. And it probably never existed exactly in the way we think. When we think about it, when we recall it, we're creating a narrative based on the most likely set of circumstances to us at that time. That's storytelling when we remember. And when we think about the future, that also doesn't exist yet. That is completely imagined. And one of my main goals is to encourage adults to invest in their imagination, to believe themselves to be creative and able to picture the life that they want, because we have to have imagination skills in order to imagine the future that we want and create a better life. So you are all imaginative, you are all creative, you're all storytellers, whether you know it or not. And we know this is a deeply um, we understand what storytelling is, I think, deep down inside. And that often that happens when people don't um, know what storytelling is. And then I tell a story and they go, oh, that. Yeah, I know that. And that's because we've been doing this since we've been able to talk. This is part of our lives. Um, and I think in a really beautiful way. So enough of me blabbing. It's time to move on to the national priorities. So these are the priorities that we um, gathered from each local authority over the last few years. Um, the, the themes that seem to emerge over and over. And we took the local ones and we've looked at them, well, LCT have looked at them um, carefully and they've been able to draw out the main themes which are affecting people living with a dementia diagnosis, those who are unpaid carers and those working and volunteering. So we'll move on to the priorities now. Check my slide. There we go. Oh. Priority one, human rights of people with dementia and unpaid carers need to be recognized. We would like to see more emphasis on our rights as citizens to be able to access information and services that recognize us as individuals and that support and empower us just because you have a diagnosis of dementia, it doesn't automatically take your rights away or mean that you are unable to make decisions for yourself and your own life. Priority two. Dementia diagnosis needs to be timely, supportive and delivered in a familiar place. There can be very real problems with getting a diagnosis how long it takes, how many people are involved and the delays, the delay in being offered any kind of support. An early diagnosis of dementia is crucial and there needs to be a joined up approach so that support is not fragmented. Priority three, we need effective post-diagnostic support. We want better information and access to post-diagnostic support. Support must be personalised and flexible. We need to reach people at the point of diagnosis so that support can be provided for both the person with dementia and for unpaid carers before they reach crisis point. Priority four. We need to place greater emphasis on the role that communities play and the value they have in supporting people with dementia and unpaid carers and in delivering post-diagnostic support. Dementia is not just about the individual, it's about the community and its response. 
We want to see better recognition of the vital contribution that local communities play in ensuring that people are empowered and included as part of the community and not apart from the community. Priority five. Services should be planned, commissioned and delivered using lived experience. We want decision makers to make decisions based on an understanding of what it is like to live our lives. Support should be person centred. We want to be asked and not told. Priority six. Carers have rights too. We would like to see more emphasis on the support and services we need to better enable and empower us. Support must be timely and respectful. Many statutory commitments don't feel like reality. Carers are often at the end of their tether. They need to be listened to and supported so that they don't get to crisis point. And finally, priority seven. The value of peer support should be better recognised. We need places and time to have conversations where we can share our experiences with others who have been on our journey. We can provide each other with mutual support, understanding and guidance. There are too few opportunities for this. Here, here. And that is our priorities. So I just want to say personally and from the village, thank you so much for allowing us to be part of this journey. We've all improved as practitioners and I think as people and friends and members of our communities um, as a result of this. This is the end of this project, but it's the beginning of a lot more work um, with the legacy partners and for myself. So thank you very much and I'll hand back over. As ever, an absolutely wonderful presentation. And thank you so much for sharing that, that story with us today. Um, it was really fascinating watching the chat as your story was, was beginning because there was lots of conversation taking place. And then there was this kind of hushed silence whilst everybody sat completely absorbed. And even though we can't see each other's faces, you could sense even through this online space, just how gripped everybody was. And then you finished and there was just this roar of um, people joining in and sharing their experiences and reflecting on what you had to share there so thank you so much Shona uh, to you and everyone at the Village Storytelling Centre and I think that's a, a wonderful illustration of, of really how powerful this method is uh, for eliciting people's stories and um, allowing people to share their realities in a way that is very safe and very protected um, and very honouring to their truth. So just, just absolutely wonderful. Uh, there's so many things in the chat taking place just now. A couple of points. Um, enabling people to be seen and heard. Small actions can have such a powerful impact and I think that's absolutely bang on. And then there's another comment here. I like the idea of diagnosis delivered in a familiar place. This is so often done within a medical environment where the person living with dementia has never been before. People perform in a more authentic way in a place that is known to them. And I think that's absolutely bang on and is an incredibly good introduction uh, to the next part of this morning's session. So next we have Arlene Crockett from the Life Changes Trust, who's going to talk in a little bit more detail about the regional events across Scotland and also take a look at how these collaborations can lead to real change and empowerment using Orkney as a case study for that. So Arlene, you've already joined me on screen and I'll hand over to you. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Candy. Um, I'm not sure I can actually follow Shona. That was absolutely Fantastic. And I, and I didn't expect anything else from Shona every time um, she and Anne have been involved in our online events and Sam before in the face-to-face -face events. They always deliver such fantastic um, presentations and a real, really powerful overview of the work um, that we've been working in partnership with them for a long time now. It's been a fantastic morning so far. That This is quite a special day for us at the Trust and for all of those people that have been involved in the regional events. You know, it's been three years of, of really hard work. So um, it's good to see it all being brought together. So, so pretty emotional. So forgive me if I have to take a pause now and again. Um, it's also pretty strange not to be chairing. I'm usually in the chair seat, although Candy's doing a fantastic job. But it's also nice for me to be able to sit back a wee bit and just enjoy what's been pre presented. So normally um, my scripts would be quite formal because um, I would be drawn on key areas of policy and practice that um, the Life Changes Trust's learning has um, influenced or would influence. 
So today feels a, a really a bit different. And what, what I want to do is talk a wee bit about our experience over the last three years um, around the Regional Events Programme um, and really, you know, get the opportunity to share some of those insights that often, you know, happen behind the scenes, um, which I'm sure will be helpful to others um, moving forward that want to do similar work and, and learn from our approach. So when I first joined the Trust in January 2018, I was briefed on my role. And when Anna told me about the plans for a series of regional events in 14 health board areas, I thought, OK, that, that's quite a lot. So, yeah, let's see how we're going to do this. But we got to work and we spent the first few months scoping out what it was we wanted to achieve and the opportunities, but also some of the challenges that we might face. It was apparent that whilst there was a national dementia strategy at that time, and yes, there were some areas who had local versions, they didn't often speak to people with dementia and to unpaid carers in their communities. Wouldn't it be good to go to where people lived, where they worked, socialised and were supported and develop priorities to inform policy and practice with them, as well as shine a light on the good work happening in local communities? And so Community and Dementia Creating Better Lives was born and the work began. We hosted a Human Rights and Dementia Conference in May 2018 to launch the Regional Events Programme, which provided a real insight for us into where things were at at that time and what people were telling us needed to change. As the animation has shown earlier, um, we kicked off a programme of 14 regional events in the Highlands and Inverness. When I say regional events, we did them face-to-face, -face. They, when we did them face-to-face, -face, sorry, they were typically over three to four days with storytelling sessions first, then a social event or series of social events, finishing with a conference. When online, we offered the same with the conference being a webinar, but sadly, we weren't able to host any social events because of restrictions. For the events, it was really important for us that planning took place at least six months in advance alongside local people and that we listened and learned about what was important in their community and what an event had the potential to achieve and who needed to be involved. In total, across all of the 14 health board areas that we engaged with, we held at least 50 planning meetings. 50, when I think back, you know, 50, which probably accounted for an average of three hours per meeting. So you're talking about at least 150 hours worth of planning. And these happened face-to-face -face and online. Collaboration was so important, and I can't stress that enough. So we involved lots of different stakeholders from people with dementia and unpaid carers to the voluntary sector to also looking at key people within health and social care. But obviously a nice lunch was really helpful too and lots of tea and cake. Although it was hard work and it took time, the collaborative approach was key. It transferred the ownership of what was taking place to the communities themselves and had real value when learning was then taken forward to influence change after the event. The commitment from the Trust was to facilitate the planning, the organisation and the funding of the events, with the content and delivery of the programme firmly with planning partners. This was appreciated and recognised, and you could see a real change in partners who seemed a bit overwhelmed, I have to say, by the prospect at the very start. But then, as the process started to develop, they were prompting us with ideas, offering to help out, really seeing the approach as the right thing to do and that it would have a real impact. Prior to COVID, I reckon we travelled at the very least 25,000 miles by air, by car, on foot and by train. And I know I speak for other trust staff when I say it was a real privilege to visit and be welcomed by communities from across Scotland and hear about some of the projects there and also about the people and communities themselves, including their customs and their cultures. It was just a shame that we couldn't visit them all. So before restrictions were imposed, we visited the Highlands, Grampian, Orkney, Western Isles and Ayrshire and Arran. And then when it became apparent that face-to-face -face was not an option, then we adapted to online. And I think we did more than we actually thought was possible to deliver the regional events in this way. So in, online, we then engaged with Edinburgh and the Lothians, Fife, Tayside, Forth Valley, Lanarkshire, Borders, Dumfries and Galloway, Shetland and Greater Glasgow and Clyde. It was just a real pleasure to be able to be involved with all of those people across all of those communities 
and I know that it'll, it'll stay with me for a very long time and I'm sure many others that have been involved. A significant part of the regional events was hearing from people with lived experience about what was important and what they saw needed to change. And both Kiandi and Shona have, have referenced that a lot previously. We heard a lot from Shona earlier about the work undertaken to develop local priorities and then the national priorities which we have launched today. But really what made this happen? We were in introduced to the Village Storytelling Centre by Amanda McCarran, formerly of Tide, who had come across their work and some work that she'd done previously. I'll admit it was a risk as it was unknown to us, but we were determined not to follow the traditional engagement routes. We wanted a fresh approach and we wanted to provide a safe and supportive space for people to say what they wanted to say and not respond to pre-prepared themes or set questions. So we embarked on what has been a three-year partnership with the village, beginning with Sam Rowe that I mentioned earlier in the early days. And then when we went online with Shona and Dan, that some of you will know, as well as Rebecca. This has been something quite special for the Trust and has really opened our eyes to what can be achieved through storytelling. And the impact it has had on our regional work has been phenomenal. I would need another webinar, really, to talk about that. So as you can see, we hosted 46 storytelling sessions. Forgive me if my figures are maybe not exact, but this did take a bit of work to go back into the archives. These were face-to-face, -face, online and by telephone, always adapting along the way to meet the needs of communities we were engaging with. From these sessions, 43 people with dementia and 84 unpaid carers took part. When we were planning the Western Niles event, we were asked by people with dementia why we were not including staff and volunteers in the sessions. So we did. And so from then on, 101 of those people took part. Another addition came when we went online, with partners asking about being people about being able to use the approach themselves in their areas of work, contributing to the legacy of what we were doing. We looked at this, talked to the village, and then we just did it. From then on, the village hosted seven training for the trainer sessions, in seven health board areas. And this involved, at the very least, 60 staff and volunteers. One of the training, train, training for the trainer sessions, I nearly didn't get that right there, was specifically designed for members of STAND who wanted to use the techniques as part of their own work locally regarding the Fife Dementia Strategy and their engagement with others. You can find all of the storytelling reports on our website if you want to see a wee bit more about individual areas. As I said, when we were hosting face-to-face -face events, part of our offer was a social event and you did not disappoint with your ideas. We had Boogie at the Treetops, Dance and Jive with Food and Fun, Fun's Afternoon Teas and many more. All in all, we had six social events across five of the health board areas with 396 local people joining us. It was just so good to see people from every walk of life come together and enjoy each other's company, we had wee ones running about, as well as the bigger ones, with Zimmers firmly parked at the side. I know many people comment to us about how special these occasions were, especially for people who did not socialise very much or hadn't had the opportunity. The trust staff certainly found their dancing shoes and witnessed a real sense of community during these events. The final part of the approach was where we would take the learning from storytelling from the planning partners. It needed a platform, but one where we invited members from across the whole community, people with dementia, unpaid carers, health, social care, the voluntary sector, everyone in one room with one common goal to make change happen and create better lives. So we did this face-to-face -face with conferences and then as webinars as we are moved online. And approximately, we reckon we welcomed, at the very least, 1,000 people to those events. We presented lots of things, but our main focus was to provide a platform for what people told us mattered, what was important and what needed to change. So, as told by Shona earlier, we developed local priorities and all in all, developed 67 of them informed by local people for local people. All of the learning from the 14 regional events we have hosted both online and in person can be found on our website, as well as this are details of the regional small grants awarded. 
The regional events are already having an impact on policy and practice locally. For example, Aberdeenshire Dementia Strategy has been informed by the approach of the regional event in Grampian, as well as the local priorities. And they also commissioned the village to deliver storytelling sessions to their own staff to inform and support their engagement around dementia strategy work locally. We know some local projects have also been speaking to the village about taking on the storytelling approach in their areas. And we also know that about the real ripple effect of this approach with people with dementia after the events um, being contacted or connected with pieces of work or projects, unpaid carers being contacted and connected to, and also projects um, reimagining their approach and looking at their practice across the board. We also know from discussions of senior members and IJBs that some of the approaches used are approaches that they will now consider in the development of their own work. One person with dementia described the event that they were part of as shattering the stereotypes about people with dementia. We have not only seen dementia strategy planning being influenced, but in some areas, commissioning approaches and also work on carer strategies. Key to all of this was a genuine approach to collaboration, and I can't stress that enough. Everyone has a voice at the table with the aim of delivering on events that were meaningful to the community that they were representing, a truly community-led approach. And now I'd like to share with you an example of this from Orkney. We've done this as a timeline, and I'll thank my fantastic comms colleagues for this to illustrate the time taken from initial investment and engagement to its impact, highlighting that this work does take time and commitment and cannot be achieved overnight. The Trust began its relationship with Orkney in 2017 when it was funded as part of the Trust Dementia Friendly Community Programme, but then began to engage locally with the regional events. We began then to engage locally with regional events and in November 2018 we hosted our first planning meeting for Orkney and then delivered their event in May of 2019. It was a resounding success with over 100 people attending the conference alone, even featuring on Radio Orkney. Storytelling was prominent and from this six priorities were developed. What I haven't really touched on yet is the regional grants. Not long after the event in Inverness, sparked by a discussion at one of the Grampian planning meetings, the Trust launched its regional grants small programme. Reaching out to small groups and organisations to apply for between two to £15,000 of grants, with decisions taking place by local panels. The Orkney grants totaled over £80,000, and you will see which groups were successful when we move along this timeline. In December 2019, we were invited back to Orkney to talk to the Chief Officer at that time about the event lending, the priorities, and what was needed to make these a reality locally in dementia policy and practice. This began a year-long programme of work to ensure that learning from the regional event was firmly rooted in the Orkney Dementia Strategy, and that what local people had contributed to was not lost and was truly driving change. The Regional Grants Programme was also taking shape at that time and we appointed Age Scotland Orkney as Learning Network Coordinator. I'll not say too much about this as I know Blake Stevenson are talking a bit later on about the evaluation, so I'll leave that to them. The, the groups who received small grants began despite the challenges of the pandemic and then we got the news we had hoped for. We were invited to attend the IJB meeting in September of 2020 to present the Orkney Dementia Strategy with partners and then witnessed firsthand it being endorsed by IJB members unanimously. I'll share a quote in a wee bit about, um, from one of the IJB members at that time. The work in Orkney has continued to grow from the first funding in 2017. It now has a strong network in place and a community-led dementia strategy building on this work. IJB members were keen that the approach adopted by the Orkney Dementia Strategy influence how future strategies are developed. So watch this space. I said I would come back to you from the IJB with a quote. So here is that quote, and I'm just highlighting some of the small grants projects 
that are now up and running in Orkney as part of that timeline. This was from Rachel King, who at the time of the endorsement of the strategy was the chair of the IGB. And what she said was, the word used here is exemplary. In terms of how this has been conducted, this is very much driven by people with dementia and those caring for people with dementia. It comes from the place it needs to come from. So thanks very much to everybody that's been involved in the Orkney work. It is really special to us, as is all the regional event programme work but it's really good for us to see tangible differences from that first funding relationship right up until it having an impact in local policy and practice. And so it's time for me to go, but before I do, I want to say a few more things. I want to say thank you to the Trust, the Dementia Programme particularly, for their vision of the regional events and what it could achieve. I want to say thank you to the many people we have met worked, danced with and got to know along the way. It's been our pleasure and privilege. And to the staff at LCT, past and present, what we do is a whole team effort and I can't thank them enough as at times it was tough, sorry, it was tiring but my goodness what we have saw come out of this has been nothing short of sensational. And the legacy of this learning will stay with us all and be carried forward by our legacy partners. We also have the green t-shirts as a lasting memory and our staff will know a lot about that. And so before I hand over to Gillian Skuse and John Richards from Orkney, who will tell us more about the impact of the regional events for them, I'll leave, this, I'll leave you with this quote from Jerry King. We were halfway through into the regional events programme when it was suggested we should hand over chairing duties to people with lived experience. And my goodness, it was the best decision. So over to Jerry. On a personal note, I would like to thank the Life Changes Trust for placing their faith and trust in Irene and I today. Living with a diagnosis of dementia is full of losses, do's and don'ts. We do not have a choice in many things anymore, a basic right that we all take for granted. Today, they gave us the right to choose again. We chose to accept their invitation to co-chair this amazing event. We chose which sections we would host, what we would say, but most importantly, Irene and I, two youngish people with dementia, had the choice to be involved in something meaningful and worthwhile, which has given us the most amazing sense of self-worth. I think what Jerry does is reminds us all about the importance of voice. The regional events legacy is that people are empowered in their own way and have the mechanisms in place to use their voices to influence change. The same can be said for many areas of work by the Trust, including dementia-friendly communities, champions boards and the advisory group, to name but a few. We have launched a set of national priorities today and I would love to see them having the same impact as the local priorities have had in many areas of Scotland. This is not the end. We are simply trading in the pink Life Changes Trust bus, sorry, Deborah, for something bigger and better. So it's now time to hear from Orkney. So over to Gillian and to John. Hello, my name is Gillian and I'm from Age Scotland Orkney. Age Scotland Orkney is an independent charity which is based in the Orkney Isles, which are right at the very north of Scotland. We're a charity that delivers services directly to people in their own homes. So we have a domestic service, we have a registered care service where we're registered with the care inspectorate and we deliver care at home. We employ a full-time podiatrist, so we run a full podiatry service from our building, which is in the centre of Kirkwall. Uh, we have a good day call service where we make daily calls to people in their own home just as a welfare check to make sure everybody's okay. We have our hub where people living with dementia, unpaid carers and anybody else can just come along and the hub runs six sessions a week. And we are commissioned by Orkney Islands Council to deliver post-diagnostic support, dementia directly to people. The great thing about the post-diagnostic support service is that we actually see people at the time of diagnosis when nobody falls through. John, over to you. 
Hi, uh, my name is John Richards. Um, I, I used to be a housing official with the council here, been in Orkney about 30 years, but I retired at the end of 2011 and was privileged enough to be been elected a local councillor, which I've been since 2012. In about 2015, some of the 21 councillors were asked whether they wished to participate in a new organisation, which was called an Integration Joint Board. And it was an organisation designed to deliver health and social care services, formally provided separately by the council and the health authority, um, in a sort of a more seamless fashion. So I joined that organisation and have served with the uh, Integration Joint Board since 2015 and I'm passionate about trying to improve, improve life for people here in these islands. Great stuff. And the IJB is fully integrated in Orkney. We're very fortunate with the members that we have on the Integrated Joint Board, there's no doubt about that. I don't know if you can remember, John, way back, and well, it wasn't as far back as 2015, but 2018, when we first started talking and, and you and I started first having conversations about dementia and how we support people in our community in ways in which we can make it a little bit better. And I can remember the very first planning meetings that we had when we were thinking to ourselves, what can we actually do, you know, that's within our gift to, to make it better for people? And we started having a very first planning meeting was when we were talking about um, how are we going to host this regional event? Because the Life Changes Trust staff had said to us, you know, we'll come up and we'll help you organise an event where you can invite all the different stakeholders to come along to the event. And you chaired that event, John, if you remember, mm -hmm. yourself and uh, Susan Kirkbride, who's a local minister, chaired that. And it was a great, great, great sessions, weren't they? The whole thing was terrific. And what was your recollection of that time? I, um, I'd met you through the Integration Joint Board, Gillian, and you invited me to chair a little local steering group. And I thought, I'm probably the least knowledgeable person about dementia in Orkney. You've chosen the least knowledgeable individual. That, that's not true. But, but I was made to feel extremely welcome. Um, as a housing official, I understood about modifying houses to suit people's particular circumstances. So if somebody couldn't get in and out the bath, you know, a level access shower was going to make their life better. But what I didn't know about was uh, mental incapacity, um, mental ill health and dementia, things like that. So it was it was an opportunity for me to learn. And I was shocked at the extent of this particular issue here locally and nationally. And I was so impressed with the services that we had available. And so it was a real joy and a privilege to be invited along with Sue to host that fantastic conference. Yeah. Brilliant. At, at the time, I think, before we actually started to raise awareness about dementia, um, people didn't really talk about it, did they? It was a kind of thing that was talked about behind closed doors. Whereas now, um, people are actually saying, you know, can I have help to do this? Or businesses are saying, can you come and help me? Because we need to support people better when they come into the shop or whatever it may be. So I think that those first stages of when, of the approach that the Life Changes Trust had was really positive for us because it was like a hand-holding exercise from the very beginning because we were all learning. Yeah. And when you're coming up against, you know, um, ways in which things have been done for a long period of time, change is quite hard for both officials and professionals and the people living with dementia and unpaid carers and their families. Yeah. So it was a big change for us um, in the very beginning. But um, I think we were knocking on an open door, though, weren't we? We were pushing against an open door because people were recognising we had to do something. Yeah, I mean, I'd been, as a housing official, I'd been to Stirling University and places like that where they were talking about, I mean, they're world leaders in the design of accommodation for, to suit people with, uh, particularly with dementia, and um, simple changes that could make life so much easier for people. So uh, when I began to look around and hear the individual stories, uh, I began to hear things that were missing here in Orkney, gaps in service provision, which needed to be plugged, things that could be done, relatively simple tweaks, which would make life so much easier. And I imagined how it would be if, if, if my wife and I went along to the hospital and, uh, and the hospital then diagnosed one of us as having dementia. Where, where would I turn for help? What would, how would I find out about it? I would need to do more than just go on the internet. I would want to talk to people that were expert in this field that could reassure me that, you know, that there was a future. Yeah. And when I came so, along to Age Scotland Orkney in Victoria Street in the heart of our town, 
I found a centre that was doing precisely that. Yeah, but, I think I think we're, we're we're still learning, John. We're still getting there, but you know, and the only way you learn is to listen to people and involve the people who are um, living with dementia and their unpaid carers and their families to actually talk about how we can actually shape the services so they deliver what people need and want. Yeah. I think the thing I noticed after that first event in the first few months after it was um, already had a very low diagnosis rate before we started this work. And then the diagnosis rate started to climb because people were becoming more aware of it. And I think for us as an organisation, the difference that awareness raising has made is because um, we run so many services here, the dementia support that we provide has just become integrated into our day-to-day -day activity. So it's not seen as something different, it's just seen as a part of. And I think that's what's made the difference for people in Orkney because they're not going somewhere different to get it. They're coming to an organisation who's already going into people's homes. Yeah. And that's what's made it, I wouldn't say easy, but maybe the transition has been a little bit more easy for us than it would have been if we hadn't have been so involved in the local community. Yeah. I think moving on from um, those initial uh, events that we had and different you know, things that we, we organised was um, we then had to work with the Integrated Joint Board about how we could actually make this as a, a strategy moving forward. Um, and do you remember when um, we presented the Dementia Orkney strategy? That was yeah. the strategy. It was a five year strategy. It was really big, really bold but it was totally informed from a grass, grassroots perspective, wasn't it? From the, in the conference and the event was all about it. It was in there because the people identified at the conference what was important to them. And I'd be really interested if you could just kind of, we could just talk about what it was like for you as a, a member of the IGB getting that strategy and, 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 and the other members of the IGB, what they said. Well, just, just before that, at the conference, uh, there was a video session uh, to become a dementia friend. And uh, I attended along with pupils from Stromness Academy. And what an eye opener for me that that brief event was. You know, it showed people beginning to be afflicted by dementia. And I recall being impatient with an elderly lady in, in the local supermarket because she was taking time to get her change out of her purse. And, and then I thought later on, after that video experience, why was I so impatient? Why did I have to rush when she clearly was having difficulty in sorting out her change? I could have been helpful rather than impatient. So it was a real eye opener. And then being one of the three elected members on the IJB, where you actually vote for policies which have a significant impact upon people's daily lives. Um, this, this experience I had of the various events of the conference of speaking with yourself and others uh, and, and people, people with dementia and their loved ones speaking to them too. I think it made me a better policymaker within the integration joint board. And we've seen many, many strategies. Every year there are dozens of strategies we see, and they're often 200 pages and they're very complicated. And it was uh, really a breath of fresh air to see the dementia strategy. It was readable, it was succinct, it was brief. I understood it. There weren't any huge words in that I had to say, excuse me, what does this mean? Um, Without exception, everybody on the IJB said this is exactly what is needed. So it was it was a, a superb strategy and, right. and compliment you on it. And it certainly helps the work of the integration board and all those involved in that to deliver better services. Yeah. And I think to say that strategy was pulled together by many different people. It wasn't just one person. No. And we worked with the Dementia Nurse Specialist at NHS, NHS Orkney. We worked with the staff at the Life Changes Trust as well, because um, one of the things they were really good at and they talked to us about was, okay, we need the strategy document with all these 14, 50 pages in it, but yeah. let's have an easy read one so that people, you know, our community can read it and understand it. Yes. And the feedback from that was terrific. And it made such a difference. And the thing that stayed with me at, from that meeting that we're at from the IJB was when you actually said, can we use this, um, this uh, strategy is an exemplar now yes. for all other strategies that would come before you for approval because you understood it. And, I, and the reason it was so successful is because the people who it, it's there to support told us what to write now. 
And I'm Gillian, sure that's what made the difference. That, that came out absolutely. The fact that it was a document in which there had been involvement by those with dementia and their carers. Yeah. That, that came right through this document. Many documents we see are written for people, not with people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this was a, a with people document. So it, an exemplar certainly is. Um, we still get uh, other strategies which are 400 pages long, but, but nevertheless, we're beginning to learn that a document that we read is also to be read by members of the public. And yeah. particularly someone who's just recently had a diagnosis of dementia or their loved one, to, to see that document, to say, this is what's available. This is what this community is seeking to do for people like us. Remarkable, very yeah. readable, well done. I think, I think the key elements for success, for the difference that we've all made um, in a relatively short period of time has been the collaboration and the listening to people and putting the people at the center of what we do is yes. why it's been successful. And I think um, professionals, everybody across the whole spectrum who is working in this field has a, has a, a will to make it better. And uh, I think that's why we've been successful in Orkney really because everybody's bought into the whole process. Would you agree with that? I would. As I said before, there are 21 councillors and they're not exempt from, from dementia and things like that and their loved ones and families. Um, none of us is. And occasionally you will have one of those members saying, I've been able to access service on behalf of, of a family member, a loved one. And it, it, it is so different than being remote from these services, actually seeing them in practice, uh, benefiting from them, helping to shape them so they're more suitable to the needs of the people that are receiving them. It, it, that's wonderful. And that's often said within the chamber. So when it's a policy debate, someone will say, yeah, actually, let me tell you my experience. And it is so important and it helps to shape that policy. It's, it's not something, an edict that is discussed in some remote place and then issued to the public. It's not that. It's, it's developed with the public. Yeah. The public. And uh, do you think if we had to give other areas any little um, words of wisdom what would your words of wisdom be to people? You can go first and then I can give mine. Mine would be help take the fear out of this situation for people and provide support to carers. They yeah. desperately need it. Those would be the two things. Recognise the immense contribution made by carers to our well-being. Yeah. And, and, um, and learn from others. You know, there are, yeah. there are great examples all over Europe, all over Scotland and the UK and Europe. Let's learn. But I think sometimes Orkney has the ability to teach as well as to learn. So that would, that would, those were my words of wisdom. I hope they're useful, Gillian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't disagree with any of that. I think I'll say something different because you've already said that. I think what I would say is um, wherever you are, you have to find either an organisation or a group of people who are really passionate and want to make a difference a positive difference in the lives of people in their community. And if you can find that, it's about nurturing that and bringing people together so that together we actually make life better for people. And I think if we can do that, then it's worth coming to work every day and getting up in the morning. Thank you so much to Gillian and John uh, for that, that wonderful discussion that they held there about the fabulous work that they've done. Um, and thank you and well done to everybody who's been involved in all of the regional events. There's been a huge amount of work taking place across Scotland where people have really genuinely got alongside their communities. Um, and made a real difference. Uh, there's been lots of discussion in the chat and I have hundreds of notes here because there's just been so much richness taking place there. So I'm just going to try and, and do a little bit of justice to, to some of the points that have come through. I think something that really resonated with me is, is the way that the pandemic struck. And instead of going, OK, well, we can't do that now. Uh, the trust actually just sat down and worked out how to do it. And by doing that, have found new and innovative ways to make people engage and to make sure that this work has continued and, and that the richness of that hasn't been lost. Um, and I think that's really been reflected in, in some of the comments that we've had in the chat. Um, 
It's been a joy and an honor to be a little part of this amazing work. I can't wait to see where we all go next. Thank you so much to Anna, Arlene, et al, and the incredible team at Life Changes Trust. And that's from Graham in Kiri. Uh, from Breda in Dunblane, thanks Arlene and LCT staff for your amazing dedication and wonderful support. Um, that presentation about the work taking place in Orkney, I mean, I think exemplary is, is the word. Really wonderful work where from top to bottom, people have come alongside people living with dementia, really listen to what it is that, that's important to them. And that that is being reflected at, at such a, a high strategic level is, is really inspirational. And again, that's very much been reflected in the chat here. Uh, so Paula Brown is saying, I love that awareness raising on Orkney is increasing diagnosis. And, you know, that that is one of the, the national priorities that's been identified is the, the need to continue having uh, increasing those rates of diagnosis and supporting people to, to come forward. Um, and, and the fact that challenging that stigma that, that continues to exist really does help people to, to come forward and, and know that a diagnosis is not the end. Uh, it For many, it is just the beginning of, of a different journey. Um, and then another comment here from Helen Jameson, and then I'll wrap up. Thanks so much to John and Gillian. You are a breath of fresh air and give me hope that things can and do change, not something that has been too evident in my very limited experience. This encourages me to keep going and involving folk here to keep knocking on doors so that that they may in time swing open. And I think if that is one thing that we can achieve as a lasting legacy of all of this work, that we all continue to keep pushing on those doors and continue working alongside our communities to make this change happen, uh, then I think we will all have done a huge amount of work together. So um, absolutely wonderful work. Um, we have touched a little bit on the small grants program which ran alongside these regional events and these grants recognize that very often it's it's those grassroots community organizations that we've just been talking about that have that most immediate impact on people living with dementia their families and unpaid carers uh, the grants program aimed to enable communities to develop their own opportunities to support people with dementia and unpaid carers run by people who know the local community and what they say is important to them. As with absolutely everything that the Life Changes Trust does, the importance of evidence and not just doing things because they are good, but showing why and how they work ran through all of this work. And on this occasion, the Trust commissions an independent evaluation from Blake Stevenson. That evaluation report will be published soon, but in the meantime, we've asked Onyema Ibe and Charlie Murphy from Blake Stevenson just to give us a little taster of their reports uh, and the benefits that this local approach and the impact that these regional grants have had on people living with dementia and unpaid carers. So, Hi, I'm Charlie Murphy. And I'm Onyema Ibi. And we were part of the team that was commissioned by the Life Changes Trust to evaluate their Creating Better Lives small grants programme. And what we're hoping to do with you today is to give you a quick explanation about the programme, quick run through of how we went about evaluating it, and then focus on the findings and give you a flavour of some of the findings in terms of looking at the approach. How did this, how is this small grants approach um, valued? By, by groups that were funded, and then also looking at the impact on beneficiaries and on the groups themselves. And how we went about the evaluation really was interviewing staff and volunteers at some of the funded projects. We, if possible, sought the views of carers, people with dementia as well, and spoke to people who were involved in the process of delivering this grant and interviewed key stakeholders and carried out a survey of the funded groups. Okay, so Charlie, I'll just talk a little bit about what made um, the small grant scheme so unique. And I suppose the first thing that um, I would highlight is that it had a very local focus. Money was ring fenced for each region. There were grants of up to 15,000 for grassroots organisations. And importantly, the fund um, would pay for services that were already in existence or that were new. There were no specific priorities in terms of particular criteria. However, as long as the project was supporting people affected by dementia, 
in their area, then it was an eligible application. And importantly, the application process was really straightforward. And I think one of the benefits of this approach was it was very local. And we had some lovely feedback from a project in a quite a rural, remote area. And she spoke about traditionally, she felt at a disadvantage. She felt they had higher cost per person because they could deliver to fewer people and they had higher um, infrastructure costs in order to, to make that delivery. Whereas it was more valuable in local and rural areas because there were fewer services compared to urban areas. So it was more necessary in in rural areas. And she felt what was good about this scheme was it meant there was a level playing field. She wasn't competing against folk from the urban areas who had the lower cost per head. And she knew, well, when I'm putting this application form in, this money is going to come to the Western Isles. And she said that gave her hope from the minute that she started writing the application. Yeah, that was good. And another unique aspect of the scheme was how the funding decisions were made. In each area, a decision-making panel of local people who knew what was happening in their area and what was needed made the decision. Um, in each uh, panel, there was an unpaid carer, a person living with dementia and one or two local professionals. They were supported by the trust, but it was the local panels, not a grant officer in the central belt, who made that funding decision. And one of the comments we had from one of the people with dementia on one of those panels, he talked, he'd been involved in, in his previous life in carrying out grant assessments, and he said it was the best process he'd ever been involved in. He thought it actually helped. You were providing local knowledge in order to make the decisions. And also he thought it was, it was a boost to the local groups that were applying because they were being judged by their peers, they were being heard by their peers, and it, it kind of increased their own confidence. And to give you an idea of the scale of the scheme, uh, our focus for the evaluation was on the nine health board areas, but it was rolled out over 14 health board areas. Our evaluation focused on nine areas, and in just those nine areas alone, over one million pounds was dispersed to 81 projects, um, which is an, an awful, you know, it's a great commitment. Um, and as well as receiving funding, projects also receive support uh, from a learning, a local learning network coordinator. And so in each area, there was a person or people in this role. And their role was to provide mentoring and support for funded projects, organise meetings, encourage discussion, learning, networking those projects, which was a great asset to those that were receiving funding. And again, it was something different from a traditional grant funding approach. And if I could maybe come in with it, the experience in Ayrshire and Aaron, one of the funded projects talked about how they felt that the network meetings that this local learning network coordinator enabled she felt they were a place that allowed you to come together and drop your guard and collaborate nimbly, she said. And it, it was the local net, network coordinator who had created this trusted atmosphere amongst the groups, who maybe traditionally would have been maybe competing with each other for funding. Yeah. And of course, most of this support was delivered at a time, um, well, in the pandemic, but also at a time when people couldn't come together. So much of this support was provided virtually, very much like um, for the funded projects who had to pause or adapt their delivery or be very creative about how they, they carried out their activities during this really challenging, unprecedented time. And, and, and one such was a, a group in Orkney, it was a dementia cafe. They had been meeting first and third Thursday of the month in a church and obviously that I had to stop. They pivoted and looked to give, her, to give a range of things to the people with dementia and their carers who had previously been attending. So once a month there was a meals and wheels delivery, once a month there was some home baking. I think they also had some gifts and puzzles and such like that went out once a month and they tried to have some doorstep conversations, telephone conversations as well and they had a newsletter and this was and the feedback we got, this was really appreciated. One of the things was this carer talked about was it made you feel that the group was still continuing, even though obviously they were missing this face-to-face -face connection. 
and I'm disappointed not to be meeting face to face, but there was a sense of continuity. And she said her mum in particular loved the puzzles, loved the jigsaw puzzles. And often she featured in the newsletter. Her mum had a had her photograph in the newsletter and that that entertained her as well and um, made her feel connected, despite obviously the challenges around COVID and lockdown and the restrictions that were around for that. Mm -hmm. And there were so many projects that brought people together with their peers, um, whether that's your social activities um, like the Dementia Cafe, sometimes it was online, sometimes it was outdoors, they used movement, sport, befriending, reminiscence, music to engage people, um, a whole host of, of ways of, of, of making things engaging and interesting and meaningful. Um, and from the information we gathered, more than 900 people living with dementia and more than 500 unpaid carers benefited from the, the projects that were funded through this small grants programme. Yeah, there was such a broad range, really. And if we jump back to one of the examples you mentioned there, which was using music, there was a music memories project that took place and uh, got funded through through this programme. And they'd obviously been meeting together traditionally, and then lockdown, they, they went on to Zoom, which strangely had some advantages. OK, people couldn't have the, the coffee and the cake and the, the blether as much, but... One of the advantages was that people could go in from more remote places and they could get musicians that were maybe further flung to, to take part in the sessions. And also it meant they didn't have to cancel some sessions because of the weather. The weather wasn't a factor. And I, I got to observe one of these Zoom online sessions and there was a, a woman there with her, her daughter and she was able to connect with someone else who she hadn't seen for four years on the, the Zoom music session. And then I think I spoke to her subsequently. She said how much music was important in her life and how going to these sessions, she really, really enjoyed them. I also managed to speak to a couple who attended the sessions regularly. The guy, he played music and, and the woman sang and when she was attending these sessions as well, even leaving some to me that I carried out with them. Great, yeah. So the funding um, is for up to 18 months. Um, and so obviously some of those projects, the funding's coming to an end. But what's been great to see um, from looking at the monitoring reports and, and exploring what projects are planning on doing in the future, many of them are planning on sustaining or extending these services. And they're doing that through various ways. Some, um, for some, the, the funding was uh, enabled them to pilot some new ways of working and now that's going to be cut, become a core part of their services. Others are involved in a wider network of organisations that are coming together to sustain services. Others are, are looking at alternative ways of, of funding, um, not just from other um, funding sources, but being creative in the way in which they can generate income. Um, and importantly, a lot of projects have learned from their experience of adapting services services during the pandemic and have now identified ways to operate in a, a hybrid format, kind of blending that face-to-face -face activity with online delivery. So, you know, all very exciting for the future. Yeah, yeah, the glass half full. So I hope you've enjoyed this taster of our evaluation small team. And the report's going to be available shortly from the Life Changes Trust. Thank you so much to Onyema and Charlie and the evaluation report, as they've said already, will be available soon and we'll make sure that, that people are uh, made aware when that is available. So uh, we are very nearly at the end of today's webinar. We are running a tiny bit behind. I know some people will be needing to head off, but if you are able to stay, we have one final very special film uh, to share with you. And we thought this was a really lovely way to finish as it really sums up the essence of what's come from the Trust regional events and from the storytelling sessions. Uh, during these sessions, people began to talk about what care looked like and what it meant to them. Along the way, the Trust captured these conversations. So we've asked people with dementia and unpaid carers who've been part of these conversations since the beginning to reshare some of their thoughts. I will warn you to have your hankies at the ready. I won't say any more than that. 
I'm just going to leave you with Dan and Shona from the Village Storytelling Centre and a small group of remarkable people who have given us such valuable insight and guidance. Hello, I'm Dan. And I'm Shona. Hello. We're both storytellers from the Village Storytelling Centre and we think stories can be an incredibly powerful tool to help us have better conversations. Through the Life Changes Trust, we've been having such conversations with people all over Scotland, people who are living with dementia, unpaid carers and staff and volunteers who are supporting those living with dementia. These conversations have been wonderful. They've all been unique. They are all insightful. They're sometimes very moving. And often we've left the conversations with sore cheeks because we've been laughing so much. Every single one of these chats has been valuable. We wanted to share a tiny part of the conversations we've had. So, over to Dan. We wanted to ask people what care means to them. And we did. And this is what they told us. Care is a big word. It means different things to different people, but it's part of everyone's life at some point. Care is, if you don't believe me, I'll believe for you until you do. It can be a lifelong commitment through sickness and health. The door is always open. Sometimes care can come from someone that you don't expect. It can come from a stranger. Care can come from the person that you think needs caring for. It works both ways. Care is kindness. It's kindness, human touch, encouragement, connection. It can be a look or little whispers in your ear. Kind words and affection. Care is friendship. Having fun and being comfortable enough to be silly. It's relationships, it's empathy, shared experiences, felt in moments, care is consistency, being seen for who you are. Seeing beyond the diagnosis, not being tarred with someone else's brush, understanding likes and dislikes, acknowledging beliefs, mutual respect. It is to support and enable Care is being heard. Listening, listening, listening. Knowing what you say is valued. Sharing ideas. It's eye contact and understanding. Safety and connection. Care is unexpected. It can change life completely. It can turn your world upside down. It's constantly adapting to needs. It's not always taking things at face value. It's try it and see how we respond. It's being inventive. It's thinking outside the box. It's going for a walk. Nature. Seeing the birds in the trees. Stimulation. It's the tiniest things. Recognising the signs. It's really having to listen. Care is social, emotional and physical. It's hard work. It's taking action. It's cooking and cleaning. Delivering and driving, changing, serving, dancing, we all love dancing and tea making. It's going above and beyond, it's pushing to get what you want and what you need, it, it's your intuition, energy, generosity, advocacy, your time, 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. Care is timekeeping. There's a lot of admin involved in care. It's second opinions, appointments, travel arrangements, planning, schedules. Care is expensive. Fighting for the right diagnosis. It's taking note of what's going on. It's a lot of writing notes. Care is demanding. It can be draining, it's frustrating, demoralising. Care is exhausting. Care is not always rewarding. Care can be emotionally painful. It can be hard to care for yourself sometimes. Care can feel like doom and gloom. Sometimes there is nothing more you can give. Care is a struggle that you keep going. Care is brave. Care is key. Frankly, care is the best of humanity. Care is within you. It's a behaviour. It's not so much taught as nurtured. Care is who we are and what we do. Carers are who we all are. Love, supported, valued. It's about challenging the story. It's allies, a network, a community. It's a hand on your shoulder. Care is love. It's love. Care is love. I feel like we all need to take a moment to let that settle with us. Care is love. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much to all of those who are involved in making that film, contributing to it. Just, I think we're all going to carry that with us for a long time now. I'm afraid very sadly, we've reached the end of today's webinar. It has been such an honor and a pleasure to chair today's events. I hope everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, and we'll take away a lot of the learning that has come through from today and from all of our regional events. All of the webinars, including this one, will be available on the Life Changes Trust website. So please feel free to come back and, and review and uh, share your favorite parts. I'd like to thank all of our contributors today uh, for their time and a huge thank you to everyone who since November 1980, sorry, 2018, has given their time, their energy and their passion towards working towards better lives. I'm going to go completely off script now for a moment. I'd give Deborah a small heart attack because I couldn't possibly allow this session to close without also offering my thanks to Arlene and Colm and everybody at the Trust who have put so much time and energy. It has been an absolute labour of love that has led you to this point. And I hope today has done justice uh, to celebrating the wonderful work that you have enabled to happen. So a heartfelt thank from me and from everybody taking part in this webinar for you today. And a huge thank you finally to everybody who came along and watched this webinar today. I hope you stay warm and cosy, wishing you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year when it comes. Take care and thank you again. Uh, and we'll hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>